You're listening to the Clutter Fairy Weekly, a weekly webcast and podcast brought to you by the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. If you'd like to participate in one of our live webcasts, please visit cfhou.com slash weekly. You'll find a calendar of upcoming webcasts, as well as instructions for joining the Zoom meeting via the app or by phone. We'd love to see you. That URL again is cfhou.com slash weekly. Now here's the weekly episode. Enjoy. Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. This is the Clutter Fairy Weekly for April 16th, 2024. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, certified professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is the webcast and podcast that digs deep into the clutter that piles up between you and the life that you want to be living. We explore the habits and behaviors that lead to clutter, and we suggest strategies to slow the accumulation, reduce the collection, and comfortably manage the stuff we decide to keep. If you're new to our Zoom meeting, we want to let you know that you can share your comments and questions via the chat feature, and I'll try to make sure Gail addresses them before we move on to another topic. You can also use the raise hand feature if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment yourself via audio or video. And we are also streaming the webcast live on Facebook, so you can share your questions and comments there, and I'll share them with Gail. We're going to start by recapping last week's weekly tittle, which was called Cherish the Earth. The assignment was to make a plan or take an action in recognition of Earth Day, which is coming up next week. We'd love to hear from our participants in Zoom and on Facebook. Who made an Earth Day commitment or plan this week? Please let us know in the comments. YouTube viewer CM, who was the the viewer who provided the inspiration for last week's Earth Day topic, shared her tittle report in a comment there. CM writes, you are two Earth Day warriors, Gail and Ed. Thank you for that, CM. (laughs) All All year long, you kindly encourage us to turn off the fire hose and stop buying even more stuff. For this week's challenge, I am reworking my re- my wardrobe. First, I'm going to stop buying even more clothing. And second, I'm going to wear my better clothing, which I have stored and tend to, and she puts this in quotes, save for a special occasion, mm. which never comes. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I think it will cheer me up to wear my better clothing that I already have anyway. Fabrics deteriorate over time and styles change. Mm. So I ask myself, Why am I saving these clothes if I eventually will just have to throw them out unused? That's right. Fabrics do deteriorate over time, as well as the plastic and the rubber involved in shoes, especially that sort of petroleum-based products seem to deteriorate over time too. Hanging on for a special occasion means that the clothes hang up in the closet forever and they're never used until they start to fall apart. I've touched so many fabrics on hangers in stuff closets where the the underlying cushioning that's on the edge of the hanger has deteriorated to dust when I go to touch it. (laughs) I touch it and it just goes poof and falls apart. Um, CM's right. Why wait for something special to happen before you wear something? Today is a special occasion. So wear wear those clothes and laugh when someone tells you you're dressed so dressed up today. (laughs) And then you can tell them, I wanted to enjoy my clothes today. Um, I do that with beaded jewelry. Like most of the beaded jewelry that I make is big involved art projects. By the time I'm done with them, they're big, they're long, they have lots of stuff on them. They're shiny and reflective and there's glitter. (laughs) There's a lot going on is what I'm saying. And, And the creation of those big projects is part of the fun for me of the hobby. But then do I have enough special occasions in my life that I would wear all the jewelry that I have made? No. Therefore, I have to wear it when I go to the grocery store. I have to wear it when I go see my beady friends. Like you just have to damn the occasion. It doesn't matter that it's not a special day and wear it anyway. And otherwise I would make them and then they would hang up and they would never see the light of day again. And I don't want to do that. So same thing with your fabrics and clothes in the closet. Pick your day, wear it anyway. And if it turns out that you're overdressed, that is not the worst thing that's ever happened in your life to show up to something overdressed. So we're gonna we're gonna vote for today's a special occasion and get those clothes out of the closet. You know, I'm gonna get my sister who likes to paint inspirational signs. Oh to, that's a to, great project. To do, today is a special occasion. I think that's a great saying. 
Right? I think so too. Beth would do a great job with that. Great um, idea. Early in the pandemic, um, she made a sign for me that said, it's five o'clock everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, the fact that I'm drinking early in the day <laughs> during the pandemic doesn't matter. <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> linda from pennsylvania reports for the earth day tittle instead of throwing out scraps of leftover yarn i made them into a pet blanket with an oh. outlandish color scheme <laughs> i dropped it off the at the animal shelter this morning and maybe a photo of it is showing as my profile photo Let's oh see. i saw that Did i saw that. that it looked yeah yeah it looked like a it's a, it's a square with a pattern and so much fun. I see it. I'm going to spotlight that for a moment so that, that people can see it. I guess I have to unspotlight you first before yes, I can spotlight did. that. Maybe. Let's see. You want to spotlight Linda? Oh, it does not want me to do that. Okay. I'm sorry. We're just going to have to. Uh... The Zoom people can see it anyway. Yeah, Zoom people can see it. Okay. <laughs> it's a multicolored blanket. And you know what? The pets don't care about the color. The pets are just happy to have the blanket. And so... What a great idea. You made it into something that somebody else can use. And that's fabulous. M says it turned out nice. My grandmother made stuff with similar color schemes for us to use or wear. Yeah. You got to use up that, the scraps lucky animal who gets to use it. Right. Rainbow is a good thing. <laughs> um, Connie added on the topic of the clothes that we're saving for a special occasion or we start to fall apart and nothing fits anymore. Exactly. <laughs> right. You need to wear it while you can wear it. That's the truth. Catherine reports four garbage bags of clothing out. Oh, excellent. That is a big commitment. That's a lot of clothes. Uh, <laughs> Naomi says, Linda, it is not an outlandish color scheme. It is the tartan of the border collie. <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. The tartan of the border collie. <laughs> That's perfect. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> On the subject of of our of our new saying, Linda says, "How about every day is a special occasion?" That's nice too. That's good. And Ginger says, "My sister has a sign. Today is a good day for a good day." Oh, that's a good one. That's also along in that same vein. Catherine says leggings challenge to wear instead of apprehensiveness of my full figure. There you go. So she's setting a challenge for herself. Do it. Go team go. Ginger says I had clothes and shoes rot in my closet. Use mm. it or lose it. Cause there's nothing more sad to me than picking up a pair of shoes and having a piece of it drop off. <laughs> right. I mean, it happens in closets a lot where I'm like cleaning out and the shoes are kind of in the back somewhere. They're tucked in. Like, clearly, they've been pushed to the back and nobody's been paying attention. And then I pick them up and something falls off of it. And the whole rest of the shoe is perfectly fine, except for the part that fell off the, <laughs> off the bottom. <laughs> and so there's except nothing for more that. except for that. <laughs> so there's nothing more, you know, uh, distressing than feeling like you're throwing away something that's perfectly good except for the cheap bottom of the shoe that fell apart or got sticky. Sometimes I pull them out and the rubber has started to deteriorate and it gets sticky. You can't wear, you can't wear sticky shoes. <laughs> <That's not it. laughs> so you need to wear them while they're in good shape before they die natural or unnatural death, given the petroleum products deterioration. <laughs> M reports uh, that she's reorganizing kitchen storage. That's good. That's a good place I, to go. I worked, on, I worked on that this week as well. Um, we recently replaced the thing we were keeping most of our dinnerware in yeah. with uh, a large, larger set of shelves and we transferred pantry to the larger set of shelves and dinnerware to the what we had been using as, as the pantry. And it still doesn't fit, but we're in better shape than we were a few weeks ago. Oh, that's good. Now, now we're doing, uh, the challenge we're doing right now is what can we make out of the excess stuff from the pantry? Because we discovered lots of Extras. we had something like 12 packages of noodles of various types <laughs> we're, we're going to be eating a lot of noodle based dishes in the coming <laughs> weeks so it's time to explore your asian roots right and start there you to go yes getting out the vietnamese chinese japanese <laughs> start making those recipes 
Uh, <laughs> Noodle art, Tammy says. <laughs> oh, there you go. Spray. I'll spray glue them on paper paper plates and then spray paint it gold make some macaroni art <laughs> brenda reports downsized my fridge from 12.5 to 10 cubic feet any smaller i will officially have a mini fridge hey cool oh jb asks does anyone accept you sneakers or do they just toss them um no they don't and uh there's a, a organization called souls for souls it's s-o-l-e-s -E number four s-o-u-l-s and so um they're an organization that collects shoes and then ships them off uh, for redistribution in other countries and um that's a way that you can take and they take miss like ones if you don't have both if you don't have both shoes they'll take the singles as well oh wow which, and then they sort of match them up with stuff so Just another single together yeah 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 the and closest so thing the they can find if the shoe is close if the shoe's in good shape then they can match it with something else and make a pair out of the stuff that they get for yeah so souls for souls is a great way to um deal with shoes okay i think we should get on to our main topic how's okay. that sound it sounds great Negative emotions, like the way I feel when someone is trying desperately to interrupt our meetup with their naughty videos, which isn't <laughs> going to happen. Let me just say that. Negative emotions complicate and compound the difficulty of managing our clutter. Guilt, shame, fear, grief, anger, and other painful feelings reduce our ability to focus and make decisions, and cluttered spaces and piles of stuff can aggravate our emotional distress. Today, we're going to offer strategies for working around and through negative emotions to move your projects forward no matter where you're starting from. Dealing with clutter is just tailor-made to bring all your negative emotions to the surface. Often, by the time someone has called me for help, their negative feelings and negative thoughts have totally taken over, and any attempt by someone to get emotion on their organizing project is ground to a halt by all that negativity. My clients are judging themselves for failing to be in action to clear it up. They feel like failures for letting it happen. They feel sadness because of what the stuff reminds them of about someone in their life. It seems like the clutter is putting a spotlight on all their inadequacies as a human. Feeling anything negative makes them stop the process, which makes the clutter continue to grow, which makes the negative emotions grow bigger, rinse and repeat. <laughs> they definitely are a feedback loop of one on, upon the other. A lot of my job is first reframing those thoughts and feelings for a client in a new lens, one that strips out the judgment and offers acceptance for whatever the client's going through. And next, I have to remind the clients that they can make headway, even if they're feeling emotionally compromised. The underlying job for any organizing project is manpower and decision making. If you can physically be in motion and you can make some decisions, uh, maybe with some support for me, you can get a project going. So we're going to do what I do with clients about the emotions that come up as part of this process and try to reframe it in a more positive way. We want to model how you can support yourself in this proce process and break the cycle of negative emotions that's shutting you down. So let's start with the most common negative emotion I hear at almost all of my jobs, which is overwhelm. This emotion calmly comes up before the job's even started, usually, usually in the assessment call. When faced with a large job, many hours of work, or a very overstuffed space, clients say, I feel overwhelmed and I don't know where to start. I hear that so many times. When the volume looks big, or the layout of the mess is very chaotic, or there are several problems with the job that you're not sure how to solve, getting overwhelmed can show up in a hurry. This emotion has likely appeared since you are probably imagining trying to deal with all of it at once, but you can't declutter the whole house simultaneously. You only need to work on one part at a time. Sure, the job is big. The project can be done over one day and you'll be at it for a while, but it's still a step-by-step -step process and you're doing it one step at a time. If you feel overwhelmed because you don't know how to do a part of it, you don't have to know how to do all of it. You can work on the parts that you can figure out while you look for answers to the part that you don't know how to handle. 
or you can call in some support, either paid or unpaid. So paid would be an organizer. Unpaid would be your friends who are willing to come and support you in a non-judgmental and non-harsh way. <laughs> I guess is the best way to say that. Uh, often my clients feel guilty. And when I ask guilty about what, the answer is varied. Guilt for not being able to clear this up themselves. Uh, guilty for leaving this mess for their kids to clean up. Guilty for thinking about giving away family items. Guilty for not being able to face it. Like I said, guilt covers a lot of territory. And it also gets doled out by others who may be verbally laying blame at your feet. If someone in your life is over there telling you this is all your fault, um, the, the, the initial response is going to be uh, you feel bad about it. I think maybe also guilt for um, letting things get to this point. Don't you mm -hmm. encounter that? I do. Um, it's true. We look back and we think, if only I had blah, 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 and then... Done these 47 things yeah, that I didn't do. Yeah, 40 things starting 12 years ago. Well, you didn't. <laughs> and, and, you, and hanging on to guilt about that is not, not going to fix it. Well, it's definitely not going to replay time that has gone by, right? Like, right. The, yeah. Guilt about time that's lost is just really a deep well to fall in that you can't ever climb out of because you're never getting that time back. So right. there's no point in, in, you know, wigging about it, right? If the guilt is about your lack of motion, the solution to, is to get into action, no matter how small of an action being in motion, working on part of it means eventually you'll get done and you can give up on feeling guilty. If the guilt is about letting go of family things, it's important to remember that giving up the item doesn't give up the memory of your loved one along with it. <clears throat> it's not reasonable to expect to hold and live with many generations of stuff like a pyramid scheme. Each generation passing goods to the next and the pile gets bigger every time it changes hands. Eventually some descendant will be buried in all that family stuff. And better to think of processing the family belongings as curating a collection to hang in a gallery. What you can honor and incorporate into your family narrative is worth the effort. And the rest needs to be passed to another family to honor it next. I just lived that process. I've talked about the, uh, about this job a few times on the show recently. Um, this big estate job that we found 17 people stuff in uh, the, the six initial family members that currently own the house, the parents and kids, and then there was all kinds of, uh, you know, ascendants behind them who had, uh, whose stuff had come into the house. And it took, I worked on decluttering and sanit what I think of as sanitizing the house to pull all the personal things out of that house so that, that it could be turned over to an estate sale company. I didn't even haul everything off. I just went through and pulled out everything that was related to the family, had data on it, had was a keepsake, was a photo. Mm -hmm. And we spent, we worked from July until March on that project. So it took months and months and months just to sanitize the house and find everything that was personal to the family. And that's what happens when <laughs> when the it keeps passing and passing and passing and passing. And eventually somebody is left standing holding all of the bags from everyone <laughs> from all of the generations behind wondering how did this all get in my house? Well, it's because you were the last one standing. So we, we want to avoid that. Uh, that was, it, it was just such a big use of my time over the last several months. I spent, I was there two or three times a week for months and months going through that house. So <clears throat> it was a big project. Another emotion that I hear a lot is that they feel ashamed. Clients feel ashamed that they've let it get so bad. And so they can't have their friends or family over. This feeling also ref reflects a lot of mental chatter in their head from parents or spouses. They can hear their mom or dad being disappointed or upset about the state of their home. Disappointed parents triggers a lot of shame, <laughs> even if they're long, um, uh, long gone from this world. People still hear their parents talking to them and making them feel bad. And it usually reflects the belief that it's all their fault, which is why they feel shame. When a client feels responsible for the mess, then shame is the, is a big factor in how they feel. But it's, it's such a debilitating emotion. 
It may be that your parents feel disappointed in your space, but so what? Sitting in the shame just stops you from doing anything. Getting in action is the surest way to get past shame. Shame is a feeling about what is and what was. And action is about what will be. So in your mind, tell your parents to keep their opinions <laughs> to themselves and go about your business of your house so you can be proud of yourself for getting the project going. And don't let those old parental tapes run your business. Clients often feel judged. That's a big negative emotion that comes up around clutter. Uh, usually in partnership with shame, clients feel judged because someone is actively yelling at them about that and sending blame their way. Usually they're also judging themselves, internalizing the message that's coming from their partner, their parents, their kids. I was um, just working a job this weekend in a garage and the dad has ADHD really bad and he has a hard time staying focused. And the teenage son came out and was wandering through the job site and his mother was cajoling him to be helpful with something. And he stood there and what he said to his mother was, blah, what, you know, why didn't this get done? Why didn't this camping gear get folded up properly at the, when you came home from camping? And then, you know, because dad is lazy. And I was just like, oh, that is not what's happening here. And surprisingly, you didn't jump in to help when he came home with the stuff. So who is also being lazy? But he had all kinds of shade to throw at his dad. And clearly... It was an old, like they're used to doing that. He's hearing that all the time. He's being lazy because he's not handling it now. And I'm thinking, yeah, and you stayed at the job site for six minutes, long enough to call your dad lazy and then go back inside the house and get on the phone. So I'm not sure who else is lazy here, but I'm thinking it's you, you bratty <laughs> little teenage boy. M, yeah. M commented, um, a judgmental landlord causes shame and panic. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and the landlord is definitely, the landlord is worried about the state of the house. They're worried about their the lawsuits if something happens. They're worried about the bugs that they have to deal with. They're worried about, you know, they know the consequences of it being overdone. And then, you know, yeah, they think that they can shame you into getting it done. And that's like, that's not really a good tool. But, you know, landlords don't really... They don't know what they're talking about a lot. <laughs> so, I'm sorry that you're having that issue. And and it is a place where, you know, when the government steps in, when a landlord steps in, when somebody official comes and says, you, this is a problem and, and you have to fix it. It comes with a lot of judgment. It's true. Um, Samudra says the only reason I wanted, P wanted a PhD was to make my landlord call me doctor. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Deborah asked, are landlords allowed in your home? And and pointed out that in, in Austria, where she lives, they are not. And it varies in the United States from state to state, the, the, the con circumstances under which they are allowed to come in. In most states in the U.S., they can come in in an emergency, you know, if there's an emergency situation they need to deal with. And, or they can and come in with notice. With, if, uh, yeah, with adequate If they notify notice. the client right. in advance. But I mentioned that the, the neighbor had water dripping from the ceiling, so there wasn't a lot of time to tidy up. No, that is yeah. true, and we do not want that happening. No. Yeah, so judgment comes from those around you, and they only amplify what you already feel yourself, right? When somebody starts to yell at you and point the finger at you about it, uh, it just resonates with all the negative feelings you're already having, right? So it just reinforces them. If you can, I'd ask the person actively telling you their judgment to let it rest. Their comments aren't helping you get on with it. Tell yourself that their judgment is not about you, but about them and how they feel in the space. That person is reflecting what feels uncomfortable to them. And they're um, reflecting that feeling in a destructive manner. So remind yourself that working towards improvement in this space will help reduce their stress and then the judgment and in the meantime, remember that the judgment isn't really about you. Um, everybody has their threshold of what they can deal with and how much chaos feels comfortable to them. And when they start to react to it, if they don't consciously think about how they react, then they're likely to pour their stress and upset straight on top of you in a negative way. And it is one that you have to shut down if you can <laughs> 
Another emotion that clients feel is sad. And this is usually about a loss of some kind. They feel sad over the loss of a loved one, a family or friend, sad over a divorce or about getting fired, retiring sometimes. They might feel sad about having to move away from a long familiar place. They feel sad because their kids have grown and they become empty nesters. We talked about that last week. It could be because of a disaster, like a flood or a hurricane or a fire that destroyed a lot of their belongings. And that uh, destroyed a bunch of belongings in a really shocking and immediate manner is is very, uh, it's very stressful and distressing to a client. A lot of change comes in life and some of it comes from loss of one thing to make space from another. Even when the change is good, the loss still makes you sad. And there's always stuff that reflects those losses. Processing a loss takes time and it uses a lot of energy. Just remember that you may not be able to make big progress, but you can work on some spaces while you're sad. And this is the perfect time to ask for help. Having someone there with you while you go through things that brings up sadness helps because you can tell stories and you get active support about how you feel. My clients usually report as what it wasn't as bad as they thought it would be when we go through something that they assumed would make them terribly sad to deal with. And I have seen that over the 16 or 17 years I've been doing this, someone who feels a lot of grief and that grief is associated with a person who owns some stuff. And they think that touching this stuff is going to be the same as feeling like hearing the news that they've lost the person. They feel like the response is going to be equally as strong and shocking when they start touching the stuff. And um, usually when we get into it, it's like, okay, I know it's going to be sad. Let's do a little bit at a time. Let's open the box. Let's, you know, take a part of the box out, whatever. We get into it and we start touching it. And then it becomes obvious that they've sort of put a big cloud of sadness around the stuff and they think it's all going to be having the same emotional response. And but then the, you get in there and there's a tea kettle and there's a pencil and, <laughs> and, it's, and it's not as distressing that, as you thought. That expectation of what an experience is going to be like can be as emotionally powerful as, well, can be more emotionally powerful than the actual experience, you know, yeah, the, exactly. the, the, the dread of how, how I'm going to feel when I have how to open this box, be. how bad it's mm -hmm. going to be that dread. Mm -hmm. We can, we can, you know, crank up the, the dread level. So we feel more pain than the the real pain we experience to actually confront the, actually the things. Feeling, touching. Yeah. Yeah. And I think our imagination is powerful, right? And, and we imagine what it's going to be like without any clear, like you don't remember what you put in that box. You don't remember what's in there. You just assume everything is in there is going to be torturous and like, you know, stabbing you. It's all going to be horrible. And, but then when we open the box, it's not, the, the stuff is not innocuous. This is a box of mail. And yeah, maybe you think, oh gosh, this is mail and they didn't get to open it. And isn't that sad? Here's a Christmas card they didn't see. But, but then the bulk of it just becomes, oh, but it's still stuff. And it's, and it's not all excruciatingly emotionally tied to the person like you imagine it will be. Of course, there will be a few things that make you go, oh, like it's heart wrenching, but it's not all of the things. And you can still get through a box and stop and appropriately honor how you feel when you find the thing that really feels distressing. And in the meantime, you know, 90% of it, you can get rid of, and you're left with the few things that actually are really traumatizing for you. And then you have to deal with them in a different way, but it's still possible, even coming from sadness that you can get through some things and make some headway. And honor the process of grief. Like it's not a good idea to do it the week after you find out about something. The week after you have an experience, it's not a great time to make a bunch of decisions. But, you know, several months later, a year later, two years later, it, it'll be time and you'll have more emotional distance and you can do it. <clears throat> in the meantime, you can ask for some help to make some small headway in things that will make your life better as you adjust to that grief. Let me share a few comments before we go on, because some of them are relating to 
things we've just talked about. So okay. says, no one has ever judged me and I've never judged anyone else as harshly as I judge myself. Learning, com learning compassion for myself as well as for others with whom I have already felt it. <clears throat> Isn't it too bad that we can't extend grace to ourselves in the same way that we can extend it to others? That is a lot of what I do when I'm with clients is, you know, somebody is over there yelling at themselves as loud as possible. And I'm like, no, 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 we don't, mm -mm. there's no, we don't need to be in that place. That is not, that is not what's happening here. It is okay. This is not the worst I've ever seen. This is not an impossible job. This is not um, something that you have uh, malignly, man, what's the word I'm looking for here? Malevolently yeah, created to make or, yeah, it maliciously yeah, is better. Yeah. Yes. You haven't maliciously created this situation to make yourself or other people suffer. This is not um, what you're building it up to be. And, and we can, we can come from a different place around it and make some headway. This is a byproduct of the life, the life you live and we'll get it sorted out. Right. And we can dig it out. It's a hundred percent true. Connie says I used to, this is also on, the, in the department of judgment connie says i used to have a sign my friend took it that read i love my dust it shows i have better things to do in life there you go right like and i said this recently maybe last week we don't want you to spend all your time uh, spit polishing your house this is not our goal our goal is for you to be able to comfortably manage the stuff that you decide to keep that is the goal that we have here we want it to be easy for you to have your house, feel safe in it, feel clean in it, feel refreshed by it, feel relaxed in it, and be able to maintain it and take care of yourself, feed yourself, get dressed, you know, so that you can go about the things that you find more fun. We don't want you burning 95% of your time in your house trying to keep your house looking like a showroom. That is not the goal. So we just want to be able to, we want to help you dig out to the point where you feel like you can manage the space that you live in and you can keep up with it and it doesn't eat all of your precious, precious time. Rowan commented regarding judgment. Not only are you not your stuff, also you are not the arrangement of your stuff. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. And it's a big distinction to make. The stuff and what whatever has happened to the stuff does not imbue you with a sense of I've failed as a human. Like there, there, it's just some stuff over there and it doesn't then get to label you as, as broken in some way. That is not, that stuff does not really have that capacity. The person that makes those labels happen is you yourself or people around you that are being stressed by the environment. And that is a whole different conversation than <laughs> this stuff is not really making you bad and wrong. We're here to tell you that over and over again. Ginger says, I don't feel shame. I have felt overwhelmed. Mm. I know what to do, break it into manageable chunks and make quick decisions. I've just had a lot going on, but I feel motivated and inspired to get it done. And then she um, mentioned her, her upcoming agenda of stuff, including dealing with her, with mom's stuff. And she says, uh, she went on to say, I don't feel it'll be too difficult to get through mom's things. I'm already looking forward to the cleared spaces there. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, like a, a, that's a point we frequently mm -hmm. make is get a, find a focus for yourself on what you're going to have at the, you know, what's going to be different at the end of the project, what you have right. to look forward to by doing the difficult thing. And in it's cleared space. Right. Um, and yeah. there is this, there is this, there's an immediate coping with when somebody passes away or they do the serious downsizing from I'm out of my house and now I'm in uh, assisted living somewhere. When they do that si downsizing step where they really shrink their belongings into a much smaller slice of the pie to go with them. <clears throat> somebody was just talking in one of the comments this past week and they were describing that she was trying to help her friend her friend was eventually was still living in her home, but she was eventually going to be downsized into her, the friend's daughter's house where she was going to get one bedroom and an, an attached bath. So she was going to go from, a you know, several thousands, you know, however many thousand square feet house 
to our bedroom and, and a bathroom like she'd gone to college. <clears throat> and there were so many belong. The house was stuffed, all full of things that she had collected. It was going to be a big move. And she was asking for advice about it. And did I have any thoughts? And of course I had lots of thoughts, <laughs> <laughs> but everyone in that position when they make that transition from big space to little space, there's a lot of work that goes into it. And sometimes you have the timeline to work on it until you get there. And sometimes your health triggers uh, the move quicker than you anticipated or suddenly you need to sell your house or there's something going on that makes the trigger happen quicker instead of with a planned timeline. So sometimes you end up with mom had to move, mom passed away. And suddenly I have all this stuff and, and I got to deal with getting out of the house so we can sell the house or whatever. And all the stuff comes with you <clears throat> to your next locate, to your house, to your storage unit, to whatever, to make the, what, whatever the action that's happening right now take place. And then you're left with the backlog of, okay, now I got to deal with all the contents. And uh, that one hangs up people and it, and it takes a lot longer than you think. So, uh, good on you for getting started and you will feel happy about it when it's done. It will be, you will have found all the gems that you find particularly meaningful to you and you can incorporate those into your house. And then you will be able to have passed on all those other things to someone else. And, and it'll feel like woohoo done and dusted when you're done. Okay. So the, the last um, emotion on my list today is angry, feeling angry. Sometimes the sad is anger instead, especially around divorce and job loss. You know how you feel about if you divorce somebody and then, you know, anything that reminds you of them makes you angry. <laughs> the item, which is why sometimes people's belongings end up on the front lawn and on fire because <laughs> they're wanting to get those things out of their face immediately. The items in the pile remind a client of something they've lost or given up that they're angry about having to lose. Maybe the flood or the hurricane or the fire caused such complete destruction that the only emotion that makes sense is to be angry at the situation. When my friend Beth, um, her house got flooded when we had the huge Hurricane Harvey here and it backed up all the bayous and she lived close to one of the bayous and she ended up with, you know, 16 inches of water in her house or something like that with it, the the worst description she gave me was she had a container that had cat food in it and she realized that the container had filled up with some water and floated away and then come open and then the cat food had sort of floated along with the water all through the house oh. and they kept finding seafood based smelling oh. you know, <laughs> little cat litter pellet i mean uh, cat food pellets, cat food pellets. around yeah. the house because it had been floated down the river with the water and uh, so it just added to the destruction in the house. Yeah, it was really yuck. It was nasty, along with everything else that came up out of the bayou and, you know, floated along, along in their house. So it was such a job. And it was so, all the things that got lost in that situation were horrible and terrible. And she, yeah, I'm sure there was moments when she was, you know, gnashing her teeth hard. <clears throat> and the thing about angry, being angry is it's set off by the triggers and reminder. So dealing with the stuff that reminds you well, what you're angry about it removes those reminders. Like there's the box over there that you know is full of things that remind you about the divorce or the job loss. And if you can, they have a black crowd, cloud around it, like dealing with stuff related to grief, right? And if you can deal with the box that has the stuff in it related to old job and make it all go away, then that reminder and that trigger isn't there anymore to make you feel angry again to trigger all those negative emotions. And so letting go of it helps some of the anger dissipate. And that's, um, that's always a good result on the other end. I want to add one more to the list. And, and this is, is uh, I guess this is a subset of sadness and mm -hmm. that's grief, mm -hmm. a very specific kind of sadness. M says, I am having trouble from finding toys where my deceased kitty last played with them. And he had a lot of toys. Oh, that's sad. I know. And we love our fur animals so much. And it's so hard to lose that companionship. And I think, um, A, you probably want to, just like anybody that you're grieving about, you probably want to keep some keepsakes related to that cat, 
the animal was it a cat yes kitty yeah oh, okay yeah. so um keeping a few this is where um using the principle of a representative sample comes into play don't make the decision per toy find all the toys and pull them together so that you have a big mound of toys and uh that serves to remind you that you can't keep 35 toys. You probably need to keep three or five. And you can also look at them and see these are the ones that um, the kitty play with the most often. These are the ones that I uh, remember the kitty playing with. I find the ones that were favorites and then keep the favorites. And then you can take the rest in a Ziploc bag and go donate them to an animal shelter somewhere for them to play with. Um, you might throw them in the wash before you do that so that they go away clean. But all of the toys, you know, cats play with crumbled paper too. <laughs> there's there's always something that a cat is willing to play with. And so p pull them all out, make a big pile, and then pick your favorites. Pick the representative samples. And those are the ones that you can keep as keepsakes around the kitty. And then the, let the rest go be played with by somebody other, some other kitties. Well, and there else. And there will probably still be surprises because mm. kitties are pretty good at hiding things they knock them under everything that's exactly yeah. right <laughs> they're just like dogs chasing the balls in the house right they they lose them half the time under a piece of furniture they can't retrieve them from um great comment from linda linda says in the wake of her house fire and rebuilding oh. a house one third the size our right. new desire is that we desire the things we keep to have a personal story for us, to be able to look around our home and be able to tell the story of the things that have earned a space in our home. And you've been talking about this all along, and I'm sure the recovery from that is very um, long and arduous, not the least of which because it started a uh, sort of a renovation rebuilding project that it is enough to m drive anyone to distraction. <laughs> but you, that's on top of you having experienced that sudden and massive loss of all kinds of contents. And that's, you know, that's a hard, it fire in particular feels super destructive because the soot gets into everything. So even the things that didn't kind of catch on fire sometimes get destroyed by the smoke and the and, water and the water yeah. when mm -hmm. they're trying to put the fire out. And so the, the destruction is, is very real. I'm proud of you that you have a, positive goal for the new space yeah really and positive the way that you focus. think about it right like you're really being clear about what you want out of the new space and how you want to feel while you're there and that gives a great filtering set for should i try to make this work in the house or should i let that go because it's not it doesn't support my new vision for the house i'm glad you keep showing up and getting support that's great and i'm i'm really glad that you're moving along in that project because it's been going for a while now and i think you're pretty you're pretty far along in the process so i'm really glad that it's going well and you're seeing it in a way that is supportive to your family and that's great good for you uh connie has a comment on shame plus anger mm. connie says i think the kind of shame i feel <clears throat> is knowing i wasted time on stupid things spent money on even more stupid things impulse shopping <laughs> and now i have to deal with those mistakes so yeah a bit angry at myself right and and, and that was what we were talking about at the beginning of the show right it's that is the definition of water under the bridge right and hindsight is 2020 too like you don't always know in the moment that it's a stupid choice until you have all of the facts and you look back on it in hindsight and go yeah that was where i made the wrong turn right over there i should have gone left instead of right and then this, I wouldn't be standing in this place. Like we, we all have regret. We are all humans. And sometimes we choose badly and we make mistakes and we do something stupid. And yeah, we all have our own little, you know, filing cabinet full of mistakes that I regret, <laughs> <laughs> right? Things I should have done different. Never should have gone out with that person. <laughs> Never should have gotten married over that you know, shouldn't have moved, shouldn't have taken that job. Shouldn't, you know, there's a million, you have a million of them. We all have them. And it's, and it's truthfully, it's just our life experience. Right. And so um, I find it helpful. Personally, I find it helpful to think about 
I had these negative experiences, but what did I learn from them and how did it support me in who I am now? I have to say all of my experiences uh, support me in the work that I do now. I can certainly relate to people. I can relate to how they're feeling about stuff. I can relate to why it feels like you failed, you made a wrong turn, you made a big mistake. And I'm here to remind you, yeah, yeah, <laughs> sure. Every and, right, every negative emotion you tell me about, I have test driven. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, 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 um, and I have to say that I have lived to use that in my work and get great joy out of the work that I'm doing. And so if I had to suffer a little bit to have the toolbox to help my clients now, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm totally okay with that. And, and, and do I still get taken out by my own, you know, negative thoughts about what's going on for me? Sure. And I go and work with clients and remind them to be kind to themselves and to think about it a different way. And it reminds me the same thing. And so it support as I'm supporting you, I'm also supporting myself, which is great. And I appreciate that. <laughs> That's one of the side benefits of the work that I do is that it, I'm constantly reminding other people to be kind and to yourself and to think about it differently and to reframe it in a positive way and to, and to start from where you are and move forward. And, and that's, you know, that's what we're all about here at the Clutter Fairy is let's start from where you are and let's move forward and let's, you've given enough time to being negative about it, to, to sitting in the places where you feel bad and, you know, give me 15 minutes and let's, think about it in a positive way for a few minutes and see if you can't get some relief. And that's, you know, that's what we're trying to do here. So. Okay. One more, we have time for one more comment. Jane okay. says, <clears throat> Jane in California says an emotion I sometimes feel after decluttering is disappointment. I suppose that's related to judgment. Often when I'm done with the decluttering task, I'm disappointed that I didn't release more. I have, mm -hmm. I have to remind myself that something is better than nothing. Progress is the goal. And, and this process is like peeling an onion, right? Like you can't make all the decisions up front. Sometimes it's too much to do. And so you make a first pass and you let go of some stuff. And then later, when you make it all the way back around your house, you can come back to that space that you started in and you can make a second pass and some more things can go. I mean, there's nothing to say that you can't revisit and tighten the ship up. And so it's no problem you want to stay in motion and you don't want to get bogged down by, I have to make all a hundred percent of the decisions that are necessary here in order to keep going. And I think make the decisions you can make today and move on. And if you want to come back a second time and a third time, two weeks later, four weeks later, six months later, and retouch the same things and go, okay, now I've let, I've lived with my first round of decisions for six months and I'm going to go back and look and look, I can make another, you know, 25% of this stuff go away now that I've lived with it for six months. And so just think of it as peeling the onions instead of feeling like you didn't get it perfect the first time around. Don't be disappointed in yourself. Say instead, that was just the first peeling. I'm just, that's just the first layer off and I'll come back and do another layer another day. In the meantime, I'm going to another room and <laughs> starting the project over there. <laughs> Well, and Rowan points out, um, she says, for me, I don't know what else I can get rid of until I live with the less and see how that works for me. That's totally true, right? Like you have to adjust, you make a big change like that and you kind of have to let it all it settle in, right? Mm -hmm. And hang with what it feels like and, you know, deal with the empty space and decide whether you've impacted how you function in the house or not. Like that's totally, there is an adjustment period, right? And you peel a couple of layers and then you have to like sit with it for a while. And also I said that this, you know, the decision-making and manpower are the two elements of a job, organizing a job. And when you spend a bunch of manpower and you wear yourself out, sometimes you just have to sit down and wait a minute. <laughs> like, you know, you have to recuperate for a few weeks before you can dive back in with a serious amount of manpower. And so um, using a bunch of energy on it again. So it's, it's all part of the, step-by-step -step process of digging it out. And I would encourage you not to give yourself a hard time about that. You don't have to feel disappointed. You can just say, oh, no, Gail says I'm doing a layer. I did a layer today. 
Excellent. <laughs> and I'm moving on to the next layer. <laughs> All right, I'm going to come back to you for a for a final thought on that on this the the topic of negative emotions, but I want to talk first about next week. We are going to be back next week at the usual time, Tuesday, April 23rd, noon U.S. Central Time. So happy that we're all in sync again. In sync, we're all synced up. <laughs> and I don't have a don't have a snappy title yet, but the the theme of next week is going to be your best and your worst. We're definitely going to survey you on this one, and we want to hear. Mm. We're going to want to hear about which which physical areas of your home, or which collections, which sets of items in your home, are your worst clutter problems. And what are your best? What are the ones that you don't have too much trouble with? You feel and like you can manage. And then we're going to kind of dig into the commonalities and differences, what what makes the best the best and the worst the worst. So join us for that next week. Watch your email for an announcement of the episode and also of the survey. Gail, why don't you give us the, your, do you want to give us the tittle or the final thought first? I'm going to give you the tittle. Okay. The tittle is emotion into motion. This week's assignment is to confront a negative emotion that complicates or interferes with your decluttering or organizing process. Reflect on a negative emotion you experience at any stage of your process of decluttering, organizing, or carrying out routine maintenance in your home. Try one or more of the following activities to explore the connection between your negative emotions and the difficulty they add to your process. You can journal about the emotion. Write about what specific activities or types of decisions bring up negative reactions. Then, if you like to craft, you can draw, paint, or collage something that conveys your feelings about the organizing process. If you like to talk, call a trusted friend or a family member to talk about why decluttering work and decisions are hard for you. If you like to write, you can vent to us in an email or through the contact form on our website all about your negative feelings about the organizing process. And if you ask us not to share it, we won't. Write a positive information that you can use to get into motion when negative emotions try to derail your project, such as, I am doing good, important work to claim the lot that I want, or I'm peeling a layer off the onion today. <laughs> <laughs> it's another one that comes to mind. Um, give, yourself a, give yourself a shot at it. Think about your negative emotions. Talk about them. Process them. And then uh, come back and tell us how it feels. Tell us what you learned about it. And we will wait to hear from you next week. All right. Why don't you share your final thought? I just always want to remind you that you can do something, however small that it is, and action is the cure for all those bad feelings. Just making some movement will give you relief and help you keep going. Those actions help you fake it till you make it, as the saying goes. And we're backing you up to get in motion. That's why we're here. So uh, do your best and come and tell us about it and let us know how we can help. And we'll all move forward together. Exactly. If you're watching this on YouTube, we would love for you to join us live. To get notifications about upcoming events, we invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by visiting cfhou.com slash Facebook or join our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We love to hear from you, so please keep your questions, comments, and topic suggestions coming on YouTube, Facebook, or anywhere that you find us. You can always reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. You know that we love when you come to visit us. And tell us your stories and talk about our conversation. So thank you so much for being here. And we will see you next week. Bye-bye.